Everybody's had some adventures Everybody's had a few close calls Everybody's got a story What's yours? Hello, friends, and welcome to Episode 5 of Cool Story with David J. McNeil. Thank you so much for coming back to spend some more time with us. This episode features a conversation with my personal trainer here in Playa del Coco, Paul Dixon. Paul hasn't always been in the fitness game. In fact, he spent most of his early life training and then working in the military as a Navy SEAL. It's a career and lifestyle he loved very much. We talked about those years and how he made the transition to his new role as a fitness professional. I also found it really interesting to hear Paul's thoughts on war and aggression now that he's a civilian. And make sure to stay tuned after my chat with Paul for the fifth installment of a little something we like to call Please don't try this at home This week's story is presented by my buddy Jonathan Baldock. Jonathan's story touches on one of his more awkward moments as a parent. So stay tuned for that. But now, it's time for my chat with Paul Dixon. Hey, Paul, how you doing? Hey, Dave, I'm good, man. Good. Good to see you today. Thanks. Uh, you're my second guest here in the uh, studio slash guest room. <laughs> So thanks for, uh, thanks for being with me. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I, I'm really, really excited. Really looking forward to doing this. Excellent. Well, we've known each other for about six months now. You've been uh, uh, good enough to be my trainer. So I've been uh, trying to get in shape here and uh, uh, watch my nutrition with your guidance. So that's been a, a, a cool, uh, cool experience we've had together. And we've chatted a lot while we're working out, got to know each other a fair bit. So um, that's been a, a really cool opportunity as well. Now you got now have you here in the studio though we could talk a bit more at length about uh, your life about your cool story. We'll see about that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so the bulk of your of your life you has been uh, uh, as a service serviceman. Yeah, soldier of some sorts one way or another. Uh, Navy SEAL was kind of phase 2. Uh, where I'd say phase one is just I went to military academy, the Virginia Military Institute. Uh, so it is a four year college uh, and it's a military college. So just kind of uh, the broad strokes of that is you're wearing a uniform. So you're always in a uniform. Uh, you're, it's a full time college load for my freshman year. Uh, I think I had 19 and a half credits. So you're not at an overload. But a lot of freshman college courses or curriculums in civilian schools have 16 and 17 credit hours. So I had 19 and a half credit hours. And that's not my choice. It wasn't. I said, hey, give me extra. That's the curriculum that was set forth in front of me. Right. 19 and a half credit hours. And then you've got military duty every afternoon. And military duty could be lots of things. It could just be running. Today's military duty for Alpha Company is we're going to run 10 miles. Yeah. And it could be anything. Uh, when the core practices for parades. So next Saturday, perhaps the governor is having something go on. So the governor comes to VMI and we put on a parade. Uh -huh. So military duty in the afternoons during the week, it's probably the whole core is working together, practicing the parade. So you've got military duty. Uh, you've got all kinds of other stuff going on. Your room always has to be an inspection order. It's called MI order, morning inspection. So your room has to be in mor morning inspection order before you go to breakfast. You have breakfast roll call at 0655 where you have to be properly dressed. So the uniform of the day is posted down at the arch. And then the officer of the day also talks over the loudspeaker. There's a PA system in the barracks. They tell you everything that you need to know. And he does tell you what the uniform of the day is. So you've got to be in proper uniform out at breakfast roll call at 0655. Uh, as a rat, that's your freshman year. Meal formations are about the worst time of your day because you're standing out there in ranks for five and six and seven and eight and 10 minutes. And the upperclassmen, uh, many of whom are cadre, they're the proper teaching course, which is what cadre means. Uh, but the upperclassmen who are not cadre are also right there. So rats have to be standing at attention in formation this entire time. 
Well, the upperclassmen, they don't have to be in formation until fall in. Mm -hmm. So they got nothing to do but come screw with the rats. Right. And so meal formations are about the worst time. Rats can't fall out and go back to bed after breakfast roll call. Rats are required to go down to the chow hall and eat. So eating is is a very rigid process, a, a square meal. It's a very rigid process. It's a real pain in the ass. And if you do anything wrong, the cadre is right there to let you know about it. And mm-hmm. they're going to be what's called in your face. And they're going to be harassing you and castigating you and all kinds of different stuff. So meal formations are really unpleasant for a rat. Rat is your, your freshman year. I'm sure it sounds like there's probably no moment in the day where you're not being completely reminded of where you rank in the system. Not at all. And, and in fact, what it is, is a rat is lower than whale shit on, yeah. the, on the hierarchy. <laughs> So whales, you know, their shit goes to the bottom of the ocean. Yeah. Rats are lower than whale shit in the hierarchy. Okay. <laughs> and yes, you're constantly reminded of that. Yeah. And as a college experience, so you, you sounds like you can't blow off like the average college student and go out and party and expect, you know, uh, be, be able to continue with that kind of an attitude. Yeah, you can't because you just won't make it. And because there is so much that has to get done every single day. You got to shine your shoes. You got to shine your brass. Think about that. Shine your shoes, shine your brass. Pretty benign, but we got a college load of, of classes going on as well. You got military duty for two hours and 45 minutes every afternoon. So you don't get to take a nap and you don't get to study at that point. You're at military duty. And that's six days a week. And we went to class six days a week. So uh, a lot of colleges have A week and B week to separate their three credit hour classes because they're not going to school on Saturday. We don't have to worry about that. We go to school on Saturday. So you can have a three credit class on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or a Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Uh, that's one of the ways that they can kind of get the overload in. Yeah. And then there's military duty every Saturday. Uh, and then Sunday is the only day where there are no organized functions. You still, in order to leave your barracks room, you must be properly dressed. You're not hanging out in shorts and a t-shirt. Yeah. Now, you could be in a gym shorts and a gym t-shirt. Gyms, shoes, and socks. Okay, there's a proper uniform. Got to be properly dressed just to walk out the door. And how many, were, were there many times in college or any times in college? I don't know where you just felt like, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can do this. If I, never, no, never. You were like, I'm, I'm pushing all the way through. Never. This yeah. is it. That's what I'm doing. Uh, there were some moments of, this is fucking bullshit, but never, I can't do it. Never. Uh, this isn't for me. N- never. I'm not going to make it. What was it that was seemed like bull? The system, how they how they were working you? Yeah. Um, what, what they can do. The, the, there are two different ruling forces at VMI. The Institute proper mm-hmm. and the Institute proper has a set of rules and regulations. And if you violate those, you can really get in trouble. That's the institute proper. And then there's the class system. Mm -hmm. And so the class system, seniors are first classmen. Sure. Juniors are second classmen. Sophomores are third classmen. And rats are fourth classmen. Within the class system, it's not usually connected to the institute proper. I'm sure that it will surprise you that many upperclassmen thought that I had an attitude problem. (laughs) So you bring a lot of unwanted attention to yourself. So I can remember this one time, you're not supposed to uh, work out. You can be called on just about any time uh, to work out, push-ups, sit-ups, jumping jacks, mountain climbers, at just about any time. And you're not supposed to work out rats in the chow hall. And I remember one time, uh, I, I wasn't being any more mouthy than usual, whatever, and uh, they stuck me underneath the table in the chow hall, and I'm working out. Mm-hmm. And so what do you do? Well, wait a minute. You're not supposed to do this to me. This says I'm not supposed to work out uh, in the chow hall. What are you going to do? You're going to go turn them in? First, that's just really not the kind of thought process I would have. The thought process is, let me get my hands on you, but that's a whole different story. Mm-hmm. You go turn these guys in, and, and what's going to happen to you? Mm-hmm. What are the repercussions going to be on you if you right. get these guys in trouble? And, and there's stuff like that. And you're like, this is fucking bullshit. 
And that particular night, uh, they separated me from the company. The companies marched down together and the companies marched back up to barracks together. They separated me from the company and they worked me out all the way back up into barracks. And then they worked me out all the way up until uh, called quarters. Mm. They had to let me go. If you're not in an all right status at called quarters, you're going to be in trouble. And that's with the institute, not with the class system. So they run a status check at called quarters and you'd be responsible yourself for turning yourself in. So they released me because call to quarters was coming. I mean, I barely got to my room. I was just, I was exhausted. I barely got to my room. I just kind of laid down on the floor and my three roommates are watching me just pant and sweat all over the floor. Uh, so stuff like that. But it, it's part of the process. Right. Uh, many guys did not experience that because they weren't extra mouthy. Right. So that the deal is, hey, dude, you need to learn a lesson here. You're a rat, man. Mm -hmm. What's this mouthiness? You need to learn a lesson here. And yeah, I mean, <laughs> I was learning lessons. There's going to be repercussions if you're going to open your mouth. What was that? Would, yeah, just immaturity? That, that's a, it, well, it probably was a little bit of immaturity. Uh, it's interesting, though, that question is going to lead to another really, really clear memory. And that clear memory is, and I changed. And that clear memory that changed me at VMI was the only reason that I was able to make it through butts. Mm -hmm. And this clear memory is one day when I was a first classman, there was a second classman and he was flaming a rat. Flaming means he's kind of yelling at him. He's in his face, this kind of stuff, which is typical. It's, it's normal. Provoking? More or less, right? And just spend his time just running him up and down just to aggravate him. See if you can get him to break. See if you can get him to cry. See if you can get him angry. Just just part of the process. And I'm watching it. And it was just pretty typical. And I wasn't a big flamer. That wasn't my deal, right? There are people who want to do that. Let them do it. So I was watching it, but I saw this rat. And right away, I said, well, there's a cocky rat. And so I walked over. And as soon as I walked over, the second classman stepped aside because I'm a first classman. And I can remember saying to this rat, you think you deserve to be here, don't you? And kind of in a real proud way, he said, yes, sir. I said, well, you don't. I said, the only thing you deserve is to try again today because you didn't quit yesterday. And that's it. And I walked away. But the epiphany moment was I was talking to myself. Right. And so when I got to VMI, uh, I was a varsity wrestler in high school. I was an honor roll student in high school. Mm -hmm. I joined the clubs in the organization. So your college application, your high school is like a resume. Uh, so I did all the things that I needed. Uh, I got accepted to VMI. Everybody doesn't. I got accepted as out of state, which is a little harder. Uh, I've got a scholarship. I deserve to be here. And I realized three years later, no, I didn't. When you deserve to be there is when the rat line is over. So the rat line will end in your fourth class year, in your mm -hmm. freshman year. It's not a predetermined time. It's when the first class in barracks decides that the rats have come together and they're a single functioning unit. Right. Then you go through a week-long process called breakout. So in, in my opinion... If you make it and you break out of the rat line and you now are accepted by the Corps of Cadets as a fourth classman, you deserve to be here. Mm -hmm. And this guy is still a rat. He doesn't deserve to be there. And the only thing he deserves is to try again today because he didn't quit yesterday. And that was a real breakthrough moment for me to see that was me. Mm -hmm. And so when I showed up at the quarter deck for Bud's, I knew that the only thing I deserved was to try again today because I didn't quit yesterday. Right. And that wasn't me saying, I never said that to anybody. That wasn't me making up fancy words. That was my belief. Mm -hmm. I just believed I only deserve to try again today 
because I didn't quit yesterday. Right. And that's a much healthier attitude to have than the one you brought into VMI. No cockiness, no deserve, no entitled, nothing like that. Yeah. Uh, And I would have never made it through Bud's had I felt like I deserve to be here. Right. I would have mouthed off. I would have done something. And, you know, it just doesn't work that way. Yeah. And also for me to persevere. Hey, the only thing I deserve is to be here today because I didn't quit yesterday. Mm -hmm. And that really helped me to persevere. And all of this process you go through because you want to be an officer. And that's the only way to do it right is you got to you got to get a. Uh, what's what's the, the the difference between being an officer and being a uh, an enlisted man? Yeah, the the broad based. Now it's not as precise as this, but the broad based is officers went to college mm-hmm. and they are leaders or managers. Mm-hmm. And enlisted men did not go to college and they are workers. Mm-hmm. Now there's lots more to it than that, but that's the broad based strokes. Right. You do not have to go to a military academy to be an officer. You can go to a civilian college, get a liberal arts degree, and you can apply to become an officer in any of the services. Mm -hmm. Most officers in the services did not go to a military academy. There aren't that many. Military academy gets you a whole better start Mm -hmm. if you want to have a career in the military. Do you remember when it was that you first had an inkling of this might be something you might want to do? So uh, I have an answer for that's a really good question. And, and, and I don't have an inkling to me. It just always was Yeah, going to be in the Navy. Always was that that's my only memory back going to be in the Navy. Uh, so it, it's almost as if we didn't really have a choice. Now, dad was pretty cool. He ended up being 27 year career man. But he didn't push the Navy. He didn't push the military. He said, you can do whatever you want to do. Just go be good at it. Uh, and he never said, I want to see you in the Navy. Nothing like that. Uh, just to me, it just was never a choice. It was just never a choice. I was going to be in the Navy. Uh, and interestingly enough, I was going to be a fighter pilot. Uh, that's what the goal was. That's what the dream was to be a fighter pilot. And so, uh, to be a fighter pilot, you have to go to college. Mm -hmm. So I chose to go to college. And I chose a military academy because you, know, you, you come out of that more prepared. Now, to be a fighter pilot, you don't just go say, hey, I want to be a pilot. And they say, hey, right this way, training's over here. Mm-hmm. There's a selection process. And going to a military academy certainly is going to give you an edge. Uh, and then, of course, I was able to go for my flight physical and failed the flight physical. Uh, great shape. Varsity wrestler. Going to a military academy. Failed the flight physical. Well, what the hell happened, dude? Uh, I have astigmatism. And it really wasn't really detectable, but my vision, my vision was 2020. Right. Uh, but in the flight physical, they dilate your eyes and they look in there with this kind of microscope type thing and determine that you have astigmatism. And it, in the day, if you have astigmatism, you ain't flying. The yeah. end. Uh, and this was pre-surgery or anything like that. And so at that point, uh, uh, it was a real eye opener. Ha ha. Yeah. Uh, to, to what now? Yeah. What am I going to do now, man? Uh, ever since I could have any sort of memory, I want to be a Navy fighter pilot and you ain't going to be a fighter pilot with astigmatism. And so what it really came to, and I say this, it's almost tongue in cheek now, but as a true statement, okay, what's the second coolest thing I can do? Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and that was to become a Navy SEAL. Mm -hmm. Now the screening process there is, is pretty rigorous as well. Uh, You do not have to go to college to be a Navy SEAL. If you do go to college, you'll be an officer. So you're going to be a leader of men. And if you're a SEAL, you're a leader of other SEALs. Mm -hmm. And so that's just kind of where that path took me. And what was it about about being a SEAL that grabbed you? I mean, there's a lot of mystique. I want to jump out of airplanes and swim underwater and come in and out of submarines and carry big guns and drive fast cars and, you know, kind of beat on my chest that I'm a, on this big old super soldier, right? I mean, right. let's just be, let's face it, right? When I was, uh, you know, calling it, you know, 20, having to make that decision, you know, we're full of testosterone, full of energy. So yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was uh, kind of the wow factor, the cool factor. And, and, and knowing very little uh, at the time, but knowing that SEALs just get to do more cool stuff. Uh, they're a lot of the test environment for new technology. Mm. Just get a lot, do a lot of cool stuff. 
jumping out of airplanes, man, driving fast boats all over the place, you mm. know. Uh, just a, a lot of cool stuff. And, and it ended up being, you know, mostly what I thought it was. Hard, harder than I would ever think. But still, a lot of it was fun. And a lot of the hard was fun. Uh, so I, I don't know the special kind of crazy that you need to be where some of that stuff is fun. But but it was fun. I really enjoyed it. So it ended up being a, a really good way for my life to go. And who knew? And when you said it was difficult, I mean, the, 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 the number of people who, who, who sign up for the, the training and whatnot, they're, they're not a lot of people get through to the other side. Uh, BUDS is a six month uh, process. Right. Bud, what does BUD stand Bud for? Basic Underwater Demolition slash SEAL School. Uh, it's six months long. Uh, if you graduate BUDS, you do get your trident. That's the SEAL pen mm-hmm. that you wear up on your uniform. You're not a functional SEAL yet. You've got a lot of training to go through before you're a functional SEAL. Uh, So BUDS is the six-month process, uh, the initial SEAL school, and it's got about a 70% failure rate. Mm -hmm. Uh, Keeping that in mind, the application process is pretty rigorous. So it's not like, hey, I want to go be a SEAL. Hey, right this way, here's BUDS. Let's see how you do. Yeah. It's a pretty rigorous application process, psychological profile, physical training. Sure. Uh, so I don't know any about, anything about numbers of people who apply, how many get in or don't get in. But the people who get authorization to go to BUDS went through a screening process and says, based on all of our information, you have what it takes to be successful. Mm-hmm. And then it's about a 70% failure rate before yeah. that six months is up. So it's just a six month long kick in the nuts. Yeah, yeah, no, I can imagine. At the end, what suited me the most, and, and, and as I, I started looking back at it, my whole life had prepared me to be a SEAL. Mm-hmm. Didn't prepare me to be a pilot. Right. So who knew? So uh, Why do you say that? By the time I joined the Navy, I was already a rescue diver. Yeah. And I was already a master jumper. Uh, jumper is a term for parachute. Mm-hmm. So most guys, when they join the Navy, and certainly when they go to BUDS to become a SEAL, mm-hmm. most of them have never dove. Mm-hmm. Most of them are not parachute qualified. So I'm already a rescue diver. So I'm way ahead of the game. I don't need to learn how to dive. And I'm already a master jumper. I don't need to learn how to jump out of airplanes. In right. fact, I'm a master jumper. I actually was qualified to lead the class for that. Uh, and then in high school, I lived on the Navy base in the Philippines. So during the summers, we have jobs that are set up for dependents. A dependent is the son of a person in the military. And all of my jobs were somewhere around guns and, and airplanes and missiles and out in the jungle. So I was 15 or 16 when I learned how to field strip and clean an M16 an M60. I'm 15 and 16 years old doing this. Now, I loved it, okay? And the soldiers loved me because by the time they get to be there, they hate cleaning the damn guns. Mm -hmm. I'm just like, bring me more. Bring me more. Uh, So I went to the military academy, of course, so I learned how to shoot and learned how to play soldier, learned how to do all that kind of stuff. Uh, all of these are really super good qualifications to have as a Navy SEAL. You're going to have to have them at some point. Just a lot of guys end up going to schools and training after BUDS to accumulate these skill sets. Right. So, and I got to looking back, my whole life was preparing me to be a SEAL. Being, being a Boy Scout, being out in the woods my whole life. I lived in the woods, man, as a kid. Uh That might be a good skill set for a pilot if he gets shot down. (laughs) Yeah. That's not useful for a pilot up in the the cockpit. Yeah. So my whole life, it sent me in that direction. Well, it sounds like, you know, that expression, you know, to be able to really be good at something, you got to put in your 10,000 hours. It sounded like you'd put in your 10,000 hours (laughs) on a lot of those skills. Certainly. And by the time you showed up, you ticked the boxes on a lot of those things that the others hadn't even started on. And that's exactly right. And for most people, it takes about two years before you become an operational SEAL. And that's because it takes a year to a year and a half after BUDS to learn to be a highly qualified diver, to learn to be a highly qualified jumper. And there's lots of other skill sets in there too. Uh, So it takes about two years. That includes BUDS, about two years. Uh, Mine was a little faster. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to be taught to dive. 
or gain proficiency. I didn't have to be taught how to parachute or gain proficiency. So I had a lot of those skill sets already. And then do you have any kind of choice as to where you get no, sent none after? whatsoever. No? Uh, I was terrified. I was already a jungle survival expert. So I was terrified they were going to send me to Arctic training mm-hmm. so I'd be well-versed. And I got no interest in being cold like that. Yeah. Uh, they actually sent me down to Panama, the School of the Americas, for advanced jungle warfare. That was more your thing. Yeah. That, <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Yeah, the School of the Americas is, is four weeks long, and it's advanced jungle survival, but it's also advanced jungle warfare. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I was a jungle survival expert. I lived in the Philippines as a kid, and we have a jungle environmental survival training just mm-hmm. on the Navy base. And dependents were allowed to participate in that course if they could conduct themselves as a mature adult. It's just a, a seven-day course, and I did it each summer for four years. So I came out a jungle survival expert. Uh, There's another thing when I said my whole life had prepared me to become a Navy SEAL and I didn't know it. So the jungle survival part of doing it again in Panama was just nothing. I knew how to do it. Mm -hmm. The jungle warfare, that's a whole different kind of ball of wax. So it's a month long. So 1990, correct me if I'm wrong, I was in university. My son was going to school at that point. And I remember that is just about uh, George Bush Sr. is elected. Uh, Isn't it Bush 41? Yeah. And he was elected in 88. Oh, 88. That's right. So he's in for two years, but that's right around the time. He was in for four. So he was the president at that time. Yeah. yeah, but That's two years into his presidency, right? right? Okay. That's what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Correct. And then that's. The Operation Desert Storm. Desert Storm. There's Desert Storm, Desert Freedom, Desert Shield, all kinds of different campaigns. Uh, 91 was the official start of Gulf One. Right. And are you involved yourself in that one directly? Or? Absolutely. Uh, you can imagine that the military had an awful lot going on before the official declaration of war in 1991. Yeah. We got a lot of intelligence to gather. Uh, We had satellites, but not like today. So a lot of our intelligence gathering is Navy SEALs eyes on. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what we're doing in that time is intelligence gathering. Yeah. And that's an interesting period in our history because that's the first time. I mean, there's really a lot more focus on what you guys are doing because that, that, that's like the first real television uh, combat or te- uh, yeah. uh, arena. Uh, the televised war. Yeah. Uh, you know, there were some, some... I know of a SEAL team that they're on uh, a classified op and they roll up on the beach and there's a civilian news crew. Yeah. And it's like, what the fuck? <laughs> Nobody's supposed to know we're here. How do you know and what are you doing here? Uh, and that was a real problem. Well, that was Somalia. Well, I don't know if that's what you're referring to, but that's what happened in Somalia. I remember watching that the, the beginning of the, the, the uh, troops landing in Somalia live on CNN. And they're showing, you know, that you could see the lights coming in. I mean, mm-hmm. it was bizarre. Yeah. And, and so... The televised war started with the first Gulf War. Uh, Somalia, I think, was 93. uh, And the same thing. The news media had just started really getting involved in all of this. Uh, And that's actually not a really good thing. It's not a good thing. No. Well, and and the the U.S. government tried to curb that later, obviously, because Mm -hmm. of, you know, they started saying, you know, well, you know, we'll send... This reporter can be embedded with troops and whatnot, but you just don't get free reign like you used to. Right. It's hard for the government to control their message when they, you know, when they can't control their message. Well, and, and uh, what it is, it becomes operational security. You know, yeah. if, if the media knows to be there, then they already knew that the event was coming, that the operation was coming. Yeah. Probably, you know, we don't want the guys that we're going to see to know we're coming to see them. Sure. Uh, so it becomes operational security. Yeah. And then not only that, I mean, I don't think there's anything that we do that really is all that secret. But technically, a lot of the stuff we do is classified. So we don't need the media filming that. Yeah. Uh, back in my day, uh, we did not have smartphones and we mm-hmm. didn't have digital cameras. 
and you were not allowed to take pictures. Mm -hmm. If the Navy wanted pictures, they sent a Navy photographer. Sure. So they have journalists, they have photographers, and they sent a photographer. If you took pictures of anything going on, you're going to get in trouble. Yeah. Uh, anymore, you know, everybody's got cell phones and cameras and videos. Uh, the soldiers themselves are still have a pretty strict protocol about what they can take pictures of. Mm -hmm. And it's operational security. So that first time you're engaged uh, in um, warfare, uh, potential combat or whatever, what, what, what kind of work are you doing? What, what's that situation? It's, it's mostly intelligence gathering. Yeah. Uh, we're... Um, and if I'm using the wrong words or whatever, correct me. I'm, no, you know, I'm, I'm not. I'm good with your words. We just got to understand a lot of it's still classified. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. So I've got to figure out what I can talk about. And even though I've been out forever, I'm still bound by it's classified. Right. There's only so much you can talk about. But at the same time, I remember you telling me the other day that, you know, one of the things about, uh, you know, the type of work you're doing. Uh, is that um, you're out, whether it's, you know, collecting data, data, uh, all that kind of stuff and getting information to report back to your seniors so that they can make the best possible decisions mm -hmm. to move forward. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're in someone else's country, you stick out like a sore thumb. Well, that's part of what you're trying to not do. Yeah. And so uh, a lot of what we do, remember, this is a long time ago. So we might uh, have an insertion into an area. And we may need to travel pretty far. Well, there's, there's no double agent hanging out and says, here's the keys to the Range Rover. We got to get a car. Mm -hmm. And we don't know how we're going to get a car, man. Mm -hmm. So we got to get there, be unseen. We got to get a car. Mm -hmm. And now we got to start this car. And now we got to go. And so depending on where it is, if it's a desert environment, you got to kind of dress up to look like the typical desert dwellers. So you don't stick out, right? Uh, if it's a jungle environment, you're trying to blend in so you never get seen. Mm -hmm. uh, either way, uh, one of the skill sets, and, and it's, it's fun. I got a map, mm -hmm. and I got an objective, mm -hmm. and I've got some secondary objectives, and I got a compass. Mm -hmm. And I need to get from here to there uh, without being detected, uh, complete the mission, and, and come back and fill out the report. And probably there's bad guys who are looking for us, or there's bad guys who aren't looking for us, but if they find us, they've got bad intentions. Uh, so that, that's a rush. That, that's adrenaline. And at the end, we're also doing a very important task. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these intelligence gathering missions are bringing back intelligence that we really need so we can make some really really good decisions. Right. So, um, the Iraq situation, uh, you know, we Iraq, Afghanistan, these last two big wars that the U S have been involved in. We hear a lot about IEDs, right? Uh, improvised explosive devices. That's, that's a big thing, right? That's something that's on your mind all day long. Yeah, is that's it? The, that's the biggest threat in the current conflict. So talking about yeah. Gulf two, right? Uh, so Gulf two, I was a private civilian contractor and IEDs are the primary threat, improvised explosive device. Uh, and they're a roadside device. And when you run over them, they explode. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's some telltale signs, and you learn to look for these kinds of things. Uh, almost all of the IEDs out there are called what's called command detonated. Mm -hmm. That means there's somebody on the other end of a wire to push a button. Right. It's not like a mine where you roll over it and explodes. Mm -hmm. He's watching you. Yeah. So you're learning to scan. So when you're in a motorcade, you've got multiple units and multiple people. Each person has a sector that they're responsible for scanning. Mm -hmm. So if you're driving along and you see some guy standing out in the desert, 60 meters off the road, yeah. there's a warning sign. <laughs> you know, why is this guy standing out there in the middle of the desert, 60 meters off the road? Mm -hmm. Well, he's trying to time you. Right. So as civilian contractors, we travel at 70 or 75 miles an hour in motorcades of three and four big SUV suburban expeditions. Why? 
makes it really hard for that guy to time the explosion. If we're cru- cruising around at 25 miles an hour, it makes it pretty easy. So you start to look for stuff like that. You look for stuff on the side of the road. Uh, they started to get creative. They would put their IEDs and they would like pour them in concrete, but then make it look like just jagged, broken concrete that's just laying around. Mm-hmm. Well, you start to notice stuff like that. And IEDs, that's just, you said that's, that's something that comes up in, in, in Gulf two around Gulf two. Yeah. Um, that's not something with the technology wasn't so much there for it earlier on, or is it it just, it just be essentially, uh, we overran, overran and overwhelmed Iraq so quickly in the first Gulf war, there was no chance for any of that to ever develop. Yeah. The second one, remember we went into Iraq in 2003. Mm Mm-hmm. Whatever the politics of it are, that's not our business. It's not our job. Yeah. To the Iraqis, we were invaders. And they had their insurgency who did not want us there. Mm -hmm. And they are the ones trying to drive us out. Uh, And their primary method is IEDs. Mm -hmm. So they had plenty of time to develop their IED technology. And that is the biggest threat. What about snipers? Not a real threat. I can't really think of anyone uh, who has encountered a sniper, you know, on the bad guy side. Uh, We had snipers. uh, As civilians, they're called designated defensive marksmen. They're a sniper. They probably were a sniper in the military, Mm -hmm. and they're a sniper now, which is called designated defensive marksmen. And they get posted up in a high place, and their job is just to look around. Mm -hmm. Now, what you did get in Baghdad... In more densely populated areas uh, were mortars. So the 105 millimeter mortar, that's the thing that you would recognize it all through a Vietnam movie or World War II movie. The guy's got this little tube. Mm -hmm. It's kind of on a little stand. He kneels down. Another guy reaches over, kind of drops a thing into it, and then it fires out. Right. So that's a mortar. And 105 has about a uh, nine kilometer range. So in Baghdad, we could be on Camp Freedom or wherever we are. Dude can be on a rooftop three or four miles away and just start shooting the mortars. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that was the biggest threat in the highly populated areas like Baghdad. Mm -hmm. Because he gets on a rooftop, pops the mortar, hops back down inside the building. Uh, So I remember the first time, I think it was my first day in Baghdad. I'd like to say that I was a seasoned soldier. You know, I had been. And uh, Big Voice, it's a a broadcast system and essentially tells you that there's incoming. So that goes off and I got a little nervous. And then we were at the the country house. It's in the city. It's just called the country house. That's where the headquarters is. We all went out into the garage and just sat there Mm -hmm. waiting. And I remember getting a little nervous. And here I am. I'm supposed to be this real seasoned Soldier, I'm a Navy SEAL, man. I've been around this a long time, and I'm getting nervous, man. And you you can hear it fly over. And it really does that whistle sound when it flies over. Mm -hmm. And that made me a little more nervous, even. Uh, And then you could hear it land and explode. And you're like, wow. And it's kind of like, this shit's real. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we had a lot of that. We do have small arms fire, SAF, which is just AK-47. It's not precision shooting. They might be up on a rooftop and they burst out and they spray real quick and then they jump back in. Mm -hmm. If they stay there for any amount of time, somebody's going to find them and they're going to get themselves dead. Mm -hmm. One of the things about uh, being up in Tikrit was we essentially just carved out an airfield in the middle of the desert. Mm -hmm. And it was actually a big operation. And no mortar fires, no SAF, no nothing. There's nowhere for them to hide. Mm -hmm. We were just out of the middle of the desert with a perimeter fence. And the mortar is going to leave a little puff of smoke. And if you're in the sand, it's going to make a little sand cloud too. So there's always a couple of Apaches circling uh, Spiker. And they're just hanging out waiting to see something. Apache helicopter. Apache helicopter. And he's flying around at 1,000 feet. And he's just scanning. And if he sees that little puff of smoke, he knows what it is. Yeah. He's going to get there real quick. Yeah. And whoever that is is going to get dead real quick. Yeah. So we actually didn't have any of that because they realized, yeah, the Apache is going to see us and there's nowhere for us to go. 
Right. Uh, so up in Tikrit, we got a lot better night's sleep yeah. <laughs> down in Baghdad. A minute ago, you used the term, uh, this shit is real moment. Uh, when you're, so it sounds like the, the, when you, you would, sounds like you probably had a lot more of this shit is real moments when you were uh, a private contract. Well, it was, it was based on expectations. Yeah. Just based on expectations. As a SEAL, I guess we're going to get sent into a high threat environment. Yeah. And it is what it is. It's going to be this. I didn't have a proper expectation of what it was going to be like to be in Baghdad if I'm not out on a mission. So I'm just at the country house. I'm just hanging out. Oh, I see. This is your downtime kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just, right. it's actually my first day, but um, it, 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 and it goes like that many, many other days. Mm. I'm just hanging out. And really, they're shooting mortars at us. Yeah. Uh, so that was kind of, a, oh, okay. There is no downtime. There is no downtime. Yeah. Because anytime, uh, one of the things they do is nighttime. It, it's not the movies, okay? The dude, there's not 20 guys shooting 300 mortars at you. That's not happening. It, it's not an infantry versus infantry. It's one guy out there. And a lot of times it's just harassment. Mm -hmm. So everybody who's doing something, uh, there's lots of administrative people in Baghdad at the time. Uh, when Big Voice comes on, everybody stops what they're doing and they get to the safe center in that building. There's a designated safe center. So all work stops mm -hmm. and people become afraid. Uh, I don't like Iraq. I have to leave. Well, that costs the government money. Mm -hmm. uh, nighttime, mortar wakes you up. You broke your sleep. So a lot of that's just harassment fire. Uh, and there's a lot of, of that. Yeah, just trying to keep you on your toes and keep you rattled or try to rattle you. And keep you unhappy not wanting to be there. Yeah. Because their goal is to get us out. Yeah. Yeah. Right. What are you doing between uh, Gulf 1 and Gulf 2? All in the finance business. I got out of the Navy. You're going to go be rich, be a stockbroker. Oh, really? oh, okay. And uh, nobody would hire me as a stockbroker. So how I got into finance was through insurance. I ultimately went into banking and then into mortgage lending. Right. Uh, so did that for a total of about 10 years. Uh, and it just wasn't really that fulfilling. Uh, it was just a job. And uh, this might be kind of a really terrible thing to say. When, when Gulf 2 came around and they started looking for private security contractors, it was a really good point in life for me. Yeah. Well, you, what, you, 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 you kind of feel your purpose again, probably. Well, I was back to, to doing something that meant something. I was still a young man at 38. Uh, and, you know, we can't get around the fact that it pays more money than I, that I could ever make doing anything in the States. And you, you're really good at it. You know, I, I was pretty good at it. Uh, we, we saved a lot of lives, and that's what I really think about. Uh, you get a young soldier, and he gets cocky, and you ask him what the most important thing he ever did is, and, and, it's, and he was not going to say, I saved somebody's life. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when I get asked that question, you know, what's the most important thing you did? I saved lives. Mm -hmm. And so that's what good intel is about. Good intel is about saving lives. Mm -hmm. And then in Gulf 2, as a civilian, we're essentially uh, bodyguards. We are the motorcade that is moving very important people around. Right. So essentially, if you look at the president, he's in a limousine and there's another limousine. There's probably two big SUVs and these guys are all Secret Service agents. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what we did. It's called mobile security. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did as civilian contractors. We would go from a green zone. Green zone means a safe place. Mm -hmm. That's relative. And then we have to travel through the red zone. That, that's the unsafe place to go somewhere else. It could be to another green zone. It could be to a yellow zone. It could be we're just staying in the red zone the whole time. Mm -hmm. And so our job is to keep that principle safe. That's what we do. We move him from place to place. One of the big companies that got a lot of... Um press back in the day was Blackwater. You didn't work for them. You worked for another one. I did not work for Blackwater. Uh, my buddy who got me into contracting worked for Blackwater. He's an ex-Army Ranger. He worked for Blackwater proper. Mm -hmm. uh, so I worked for Aranus and then Aegis and then Dyncor. Mm -hmm. uh, Blackwater uh, no longer exists under the name Blackwater. Mm -hmm. uh, they got some, uh, some, some bad press. They had branding issues. <laughs> branding <laughs> issues. 
Uh, so Eric Prince is the owner. He's still out there. He's still yeah. contracting around the world. Right. Just Blackwater as a name isn't being used any longer. Yeah. Yeah. My buddy worked for them and he had a really good time with a good experience with them. Yeah. Uh, in all of these, in all of these different situations where you uh, had uh, somebody potentially looking to take you out, uh, I'm, I'm guessing that your unit uh, probably had to take other people out, enemy, uh, or uh, what's the term you would use for uh, bad guys? Is that a situation where you've been uh, working for a team where you guys had to take somebody out? Or is that something you can even talk about? You, uh, you know, when, when you go on a mission, uh, back as a SEAL, uh, when you go on a mission, it's going to be dangerous. Mm-hmm. SEALs don't get called to go do a survey of the Empire State Building. Yeah. The whole point is it's dangerous. Mm-hmm. That's why SEALs are going. And the danger is usually detection. And you're in a place where the people who were there wouldn't be happy that you were there. Yep. Uh, and uh, sometimes when that happens, uh, you've got to save your own life mm-hmm. and you've got to save your own team's life mm-hmm. uh, from that threat of those bad guys. Mm-hmm. And, and everything that all of your training since day one is preparing you to be able to make those Air trigger decisions. Yeah. Instant yeah. decisions. Instant decisions. Uh, that the United States government can stand by. Yeah. Not just when you get back and you got to talk to the old man. Yeah. That the United States government can stand by. Yeah. And so, yeah, there's a lot of, of quick decisions uh, of how much force to use. Yeah. And, and you've got to own that. You've got to own that. Is it? Now, because you have to do that, and I understand what you're saying to me, uh, because you have to make those decisions and you have to live with yourself after, is there such thing as a soldier comes back who's not affected by PTSD? You know, there are things that happen uh, when I talk about Navy SEALs. Navy SEALs are the elite fighting force of the world, Mm. like the world has never seen. And so I'm going to be more specific about SEALs. Uh, I had a buddy talking to me couple years ago and a similar conversation because there was some bad press for some seals out there about some things that they may or may not have done. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, listen, what you have to understand is Navy SEALs are called upon to do things that no man should ever be asked to do. Right. And we don't really know it at the time. And Navy SEALs see things that no man really should ever see. Sure. And so there's no way for you to be unaffected. Can't really speak all that well about uh, a regular fighting force of Marine infantry or Army infantry. For sure, they see and face things that uh, were pretty unpleasant and probably we weren't supposed to see or face as humans. And it's going to affect them as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, The whole PTSD, and I'm really not qualified to talk about that. Certainly, I have to be careful. This is um, almost funny. It's almost funny. It's just funny. I I can't watch horror movies. Mm -hmm. I don't really like them. But if I watch horror movies, I will have nightmares. And the nightmares will not be about the subject matter in the horror movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I I, um, was chatting in an earlier episode of uh, the podcast with a friend named Frank, who uh, was a correctional officer for many years and we talked about PTSD and, and uh, he certainly felt like he'd been greatly affected by that okay. over the years he talked about um, uh, gallows humor, talked about seeing like guys getting their heads stomped flat uh, uh, you know in, in a prison and, and how horrible that was and, and that was one of the things that he, he, one of the things that he brought up was gallows humor and, and, and being able to process that in some way and often humor was the way humor is a, as a big fallback of the soldier. Mm -hmm. It really, really is. And uh, I don't really know how effective it is or how it came about, but that's a big, big fallback of the soldier is to try to make light of this stuff. That's really, really not light stuff. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as, as I get older, I'm kind of like, you know what? War just really doesn't need to happen. And, and 
knowing what I did as a young man, knowing I was full gung-ho patriotic, this is my life, duty on our country. And now I'm kind of like, yeah, war, we just really don't need to have war. Humans don't need to go through that. Uh, it's usually greed, it's economy, mm-hmm. and any other disputes, I mean, we can settle that without killing people, and we can settle that without people losing loved ones, and we can settle that without violence and brutality. And so as I get older, I, mean, I guess most people mellow as they get a little older, and I just feel like war needs to really be something of the past. Human beings don't need to see other human beings dying. And human beings don't need to die so someone can make more money. Mm. And war is always based on economics. We can go back through history. War is based on economics. Uh, You have something that I want, and I think I'm strong enough to take it from you. Yeah. And that's war. And and it just really needs to be a thing of the past, but that's a whole other conversation. What was the what was it that prompted your uh, your exit from uh, from that life finally? Yeah, well, it's interesting. The uh, conflict has reduced a lot. Uh, we have no more military in Iraq, and the amount of civilian forces is reduced by I don't know for sure eighty or ninety percent. So there's just not as big of a need uh, in Afghanistan. We're still there. Uh, but we have less going on, less military and less civilians. Mm-hmm. So essentially what it, what it really meant was the work was drying up. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd have stayed and done it forever. Uh, when I tell people that about the least stress I've ever had in life was when I was a civilian contractor in Iraq, they just look at me and, and can't understand. And the least stress I've ever had in my adult life was when I was a private civilian contractor in Iraq. Mm-hmm. I got a job to do. I got to go do my job. And then I come home and that's it. Don't worry about anything else. Right. Not, not, no kids are, are needing uh, to be bathed or, or laundry to be done or driving in traffic or grocery store or paying the bills and all, all of those little tiny mundane things that in time they add up and they do become stress. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't have any of that. I right. wake up in the morning, go do my job come home at night and it was the least stress or least stressful time of my adult life was being a civilian contractor in Iraq. I would have stayed doing that a long time. Yeah. So that, well, you mentioned before that if, you know, uh, uh, you know, if you got the call and somebody said, you, you, we need you, you should come back. You, you'd be back. I'd be gone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, and, and why is that? I love it. I love being on the road. Yeah. When you're on the road, you're in your motorcade, three or four big SUVs armored up. Everybody's carrying a big fancy gun. Everybody's scanning for threat. Uh, I love it. I love being out there. I love being on the road. I love the the potential for for what's going on. I, just, I love everything about it. That must be addictive. It, that uh, rush. It's adrenaline, right? It's yeah. adrenaline. And you have adrenaline. Uh, the moment you lock and load your weapon, yeah, you're 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 not looking at any bad guys. Nothing has happened. As soon as you lock and load the weapon, you're going to get a boost of adrenaline. So mm-hmm. it's adrenaline, and so yeah, it's chasing adrenaline. And you've got to be on your game. You're scanning. Your job is to scan your sector for bad guys or threats or anything like that. So it's not a joyride. You're scanning. You you are on the ball. And I enjoy being that intensely focused. I enjoy that. Mm-hmm. After all that training and that life and, and being kind of in the moment like that all the time, can you, can you turn that off when you switch gears? And go- <laughs> you know, uh, you can't really. Yeah. So I still kind of chase adrenaline. Yeah. Uh, and most of how I chase my adrenaline is on the bicycle every day. Yeah. Uh, and I make a little joke about, you know, living here in Coco, it's a lot like when I was in Iraq. Somebody's trying to kill me every day. All right. And so I'm on my bicycle and I ride it fast. I've seen I, you ride your bike. <laughs> <laughs> and so I ride it fast and hear uh, people as prolific as bicycles are 
Traffic is not looking for bicycles. Yeah. So every day somebody pulls out in front of me. Every day somebody cuts me off. And, you know, I'm going 15, 16, 18 miles an hour pedaling my, 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 myself to go. And now you got to jam on the brakes and maneuver. Uh, and I've just reframed it. I've just reframed it that that's part of the fun. Mm-hmm. It, it's, it started making me a little angry sometimes. And it's because you took it personally. Mm-hmm. The person doesn't know me. Yeah. So I just had to reframe it and then make it part of the fun. Yeah. So we just talked about, you know, reframing how you live your life and sort of uh, coming out of being in that situation where you're kind of always on for work. How do you end up in Coco? You know, it was always my plan to live in Costa Rica. Uh, Costa Rica is an outdoorsman's paradise. Mm -hmm. I love being in the water. I love being in the jungle. I love being outside. So we can be outside every day of the year here. Even in rainy season, we can go outside every single day of the year. We can get fresh air. We can get sunshine. It's beautiful. And I love it here. Uh, So it was always my plan to come to Costa Rica. I love being in the jungle. I love being in the jungle. And there's lots to do out there. Lots of different animals, flowers, all kinds of things that you can't see anywhere else in the world. I love that. Coco ended up being the closest major town to the international airport. Mm -hmm. And at the time, it was important for me to still be close to the international airport. So that's Mm -hmm. when Coco got selected. Why was that? I was still dating my girlfriend from the States. Oh, okay. Didn't have anything (laughs) to do with it. coming to see me or me going to see her. Uh, The international airport is just 20, 25 minutes up the road. Okay. And so you let you land in Coco. Uh, and how long is it, how long are you here before you just, de- before you decide that you want to get into the, the fitness and wellness business? You know, I was here for a couple of years after my first three and a half years in Iraq as a contractor. Mm-hmm. I didn't do a damn thing, but drink beer in the pool. Right. And Decompress. That's right. I was physically, mentally, emotionally tired. Mm-hmm. And took a couple of years to figure out, okay, so this is over and, and I'm bored. And then it got a little worse. I uh, was starting to not feel great. Like, what's the point? Mm-hmm. I had no purpose. Right. Uh, so I applied to go back to Iraq and I got, yeah. and immediately I've got purpose again. Yeah. And that was a 13 month contract and the contract didn't get renewed. So I came back to Coco. Yeah. There must be, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but there's got to be a sense of uh, when uh, you're a career that you love like that so much, when you realize that you're, that's that part of your life is ending, you must mourn that for a while. So I'm not going to use the word depressed. Yeah. I'm certainly going to say sad, Yeah. perhaps mourning Mm -hmm. that it's over. Yeah. It's over. Uh, And it is over for me. Uh, because no matter what it is, the skill sets that I have, no matter what it is that I've done, now they've got lots of 30-year-olds to choose from. Mm-hmm. And it's just the way that is. Mm-hmm. So it is over for me. Mm-hmm. And it took a while for me to come to terms with that. And uh, along the way, I had already become a personal trainer. And then I found out I'm a pretty good personal trainer. Mm -hmm. And then I learned that I'm doing a lot more than teaching people how to build muscles. I'm teaching them how to live a healthy lifestyle. And so in a way, uh, I actually might be saving some lives. Absolutely. And that's really fulfilling to me. And it's really rewarding to me. It really, really is that that's what feeds me, gives me my purpose. Mm -hmm. And so I'm still thinking about going back to Iraq and Mm -hmm. and I just had to realize, okay, listen, so maybe you get yourself back to Iraq and maybe you get yourself dead and then you can't come back and be a trainer and teach people how to live healthy lifestyles. Remember what I do is not build muscles is how to live a healthy lifestyle. And you know this, we've been training for six or seven or eight months, so you know it's a lot more than muscles. Uh, And so what if there was somebody else that I still need to reach? Or what if there's a hundred people that I still need to reach? If I went to Iraq and got myself dead, I wouldn't be able to do that. 
Mm-hmm. I don't care if I go get myself dead, man. No big deal. I'm dead. You don't care. Mm-hmm. When I was 22 years old, man, they stood us all up in buds and said, if you become a SEAL, which you probably will not, there's a 25% chance you will not see your 30th birthday. Great, man. I don't mind being dead. Hell, I want to go out in the hail of bullets, man. I'd love for them to send my old man a medal. Mm-hmm. He saved his whole unit. I mean, who doesn't want that? Right. I don't care if I go get dead. That's the kind of stuff that you dream of as a kid when you're playing right on the sandlot with your uh, friends, right? And, and it really is that. And and so, but now I have a new calling and a new purpose. And the 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 job title is personal trainer. Uh, but what it is is teaching people how to live healthy lifestyles, mm-hmm. and that's radiating out. They're telling their friends, "Hey, don't eat that." Well, why not? It's bad for you, all I know, but why? Specifically, why? Yeah. And how can you eat something else that could be as satisfying that's good for you? So it's, it's radiating out. And so, so what I really do is teach people how to live a healthy lifestyle. And that's really, really rewarding to me. It, it's my purpose. And one of the things that you told me that I thought was really interesting when we first started training was you said as a, as a, as a soldier, you spent your whole life having people tell you what to do, but nobody ever told you why. Mm, yeah. And now what you do is you tell people why you tell them they, they should do this, that, and the other thing in terms of nutrition or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. You know? and, and I think that's important. And now as soldiers, they tell you what to do, but they don't tell you why. There's a really good reason for that. You can't have soldiers being used to asking questions. Sure. Okay. You need to tell that unit to go up that hill where bad things might happen. They just need to go up that hill and not ask questions. So mm-hmm. we get that. Uh, but as, as we're, we're not soldiers, so talking about why to do this, it makes it so much easier to embrace not eating pasta or rice. It makes it so much easier to know because here's what it does in your body chemically. And here's how we can fix that. Hey, why should I be doing push-ups? I don't really care if my chest is any bigger. Well, I understand that. But resistance training is not just giving you bigger, stronger muscles. It's making your skeletal system and your joints stronger. It's making you less likely to fall down. And if you do fall down, you're less likely to get hurt. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's easier for people to embrace some kind of a change when they can be told very specifically how and why it works. Right. And there's two different types of training that you do. You do the training at the gym with weights and, and, and all that, that the gym offers mm-hmm. uh, a person to uh, get into uh, shape. Mm-hmm. But what we do at the beach is we do uh, uh, training with our own body weight. That's right. right? And uh, it's interesting because one of the first things you told me about that when we first started doing was, was that uh, soldiers have been training soldiers for thousands of years without ever stepping into a gym. That's I mean, exactly the Romans right. did it. And that's true. Right. So soldiers have been training soldiers to become soldiers for thousands of years, having never set foot in a gym. Yeah. And we're just following that philosophy right here at the beach. And we get to do it at the beach uh, in our particular situation at 10 a.m. on the most beautiful days. Uh, and what's uh, more pleasant. It's pretty cool, isn't it? And that's my office. So think about that. So it's pretty cool. And um, so the, one of the things, too, that, uh, you know, I wanted to uh, have you on to talk about, too, is what one of the things I appreciate about you specifically is uh, you're a guy who spent most of his life training to do one thing, to be a soldier. Uh, and then when that came to an end, came a real seeker. I mean, you're a guy who's looking for answers. It's yeah. not, not just about figuring out how to make your body stronger and eat better and all that kind of stuff. But you spent a whole lot of time researching um, how to get your mind in a better space, um, uh, how to be more at one with the universe and mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think a lot of philosophies that maybe people might be surprised to find out that a soldier was really interested in exploring because maybe we don't think of soldiers of going in that route. And, and, and we wouldn't. And uh, soldiers have a very linear path mm-hmm. and it's, it's follow orders. Yeah. And that's it. And, and I did that. OK, I did that. And I'm happy. Uh, uh, Virginia Military Institute is a critical point in my life and shaped me. Uh, being a Navy SEAL was a critical point in my life and it shaped me. Uh, going back as a civilian contractor, it wasn't as big as the others, but it was a critical point in my life and it, it shaped me. And I, I, I just want to know more. I want to know more. I want to know more about life. What's going on here? What are we doing here? There's mm-hmm. got to be a purpose. 
and I want to know more about my purpose. I want to know more about helping people to find their purpose. And that surely is not linear. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's anything but linear. <laughs> uh, and as you know, you know, I got thousands of hours into watching YouTube uh, and I watch everything that comes across. Now, I may search for how to build a better bicep, but, you know, YouTube, there's this whole string of stuff on the right. And so I've watched uh, car salesmen. I've watched pickup artists. Uh, I now follow a monk and a yogi and a swami. Mm-hmm. I follow a neurosurgeon, all of these things. Because trying to explore our mind. Now, it's also very purposeful as a trainer. If I can understand how your mind works better, then I can get you to do more with your body. Mm-hmm. So it is all, it's connected. But then if we understand more of how the mind works, we can use that to our advantage. So yeah, I'm, I'm a real seeker of knowledge, mm-hmm. real seeker of all knowledge that I can get out there. Why are we here? What are we doing here? How can we make life better? How can we make cocoa better? How can we make Costa Rica better? Mm -hmm. How can we make the world better? Uh, So yeah, I'm real, real seeker of of all knowledge. What do you like best about what you do now about your work with your clients? Yeah, it's kind of like we said before, right? uh, I'm, I'm super lucky that my clients just, they, they kind of come to me and we already are somehow connected with at least some similar thought processes and beliefs. Mm-hmm. And so what I really mean is I get along with all of my clients and I like all of my clients mm-hmm. and I enjoy training with them. We know there's plenty of jobs out there where you may have a client and you just don't like that damn client, but it's your job and you need that commission. So I don't have that. I don't have any clients that I don't want to be around. It's not, oh, fuck, now I got to go train with Dave. No, it's not that. I love training with you and Belinda and all my clients. So that's really awesome for me. And then at the end, it's, it's, it's how to teach people how to live a healthy lifestyle. Mm-hmm. It, it makes you more happy. So in the end, we're teaching people how to be happy. If carrying groceries from your car to your house is difficult you're not happy. Yeah. Now, that's not going to send you into a state of depression. That's not what I'm talking about. But if that's difficult, you're not happy. Uh, if walking on the beach is difficult, you're not happy experiencing one of the things that should be wonderful. Yeah. So what we do is teach people how to have strong, healthy bodies so their body doesn't get in their way. So carrying groceries is a non-issue. You don't even think about it. You don't think, I'm so happy I'm able to carry my groceries. It's a non-issue. What does that mean? Frees up your energy to go somewhere else. If you're carrying groceries, you're like, God, I got to set these damn things down. Your energy and your focus just went to, this is hard. So if carrying groceries is a non-issue for you, your energy can go someplace useful where you can be happy. Mm -hmm. So we're really, we're teaching people how to live a healthy lifestyle, which helps them to be happy. Yeah. And you're also in a place like Coco. There's a lot of people who are down here who are retired. Probably a lot of your clients are just starting to work out seriously for the first time, right? That's right. Many, many, uh, if we're going to use some big proper terms, my market demographic is mostly retired people. And many of them have never had any kind of organized training before. So it's all new. Uh, They don't have any kind of nutritional training. Uh, everybody knows if you eat beer and drink pizza every day, you're going to be fat. Okay. But we get into the specifics of how nutrition works and it really helps us to make better decisions. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's ground zero for lots and lots of people. And also living in a way too, because you move down to a place like this because you do want to enjoy some fun food and some drinks and, uh, you know, and being able to live in a way where you can, uh, live in a way where you can still do that from time to time, but it doesn't, uh, you know, overwhelm your system. Yeah. Pizza can be part of a healthy lifestyle, Mm -hmm. uh, beer or wine, uh, or a nice rum can be part of a healthy lifestyle. And so if that's something that you choose to do, if you're a person who doesn't do those things, good for you. That's awesome. Um, but we teach how it works and it helps us to make better decisions where pizza can be part of a healthy lifestyle instead of part of an unhealthy lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And you were talking about your target demographic, hence the name of your company, which is ageless athletes. Yeah. Uh, So, and it really means we're never too old or too young. 
Uh, but yeah, most here it's we're ageless. We don't have to stop. Mm-hmm. Uh, the body is actually not made to break down. Body is made to continue, but the body does need constant maintenance. Mm-hmm. If you don't change the oil in your car, what's going to happen? At some point, it's going to idle rough. And at some point, if you keep on going, the engine's going to seize up. You change that oil, man, and your car will keep going. Ask Subaru. Yeah. The body is the same way. The reason people's bodies are breaking down is because they're sitting in a chair for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, drinking Coke and eating cheeseburgers. Mm -hmm. That's not maintenance. And yes, the body will break down. But remember, that's not the same thing as designed to break down. Our body is designed to go as long as we can go. We just have to treat it properly. So where do you see see yourself in in 10 years from now? Yeah, I don't even know. It's it's a really good question. And so all of my life, we're given that kind of a question, right? Uh, uh, Your high school guidance counselor, uh, your college advisor, any job application or interview that's a a substantial job, they're going to ask you, where do you see yourself in five years? Man, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, What I do know... Is, uh, you know, my mantra is to make the world a better place one person at a time. And, and I'm doing that. And if I just keep doing that, I really don't need anything more. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, just, that's given me purpose. It, it's, it means I have a purpose on this planet. Uh, and, and, and that can just continue forever. Yeah. Uh, can it grow? Sure. I'd like to find a way to reach more people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you have helped me to get my YouTube channel started. Mm-hmm. And so that's a way to reach more people. Yeah. Absolutely. So I'd like to figure out how to reach more people. I don't need more myself, just reach more people. And it become, it can become exponential teaching people how to live a healthy lifestyle. Yeah. Look, I don't even know if that's a fair question because I've asked many of my guests so far what they think they're going to be doing in 10 years. And I don't know what the answer is if you ask me either. <laughs> I just know that I like what I do right now. Right. I like the field that I've worked in for, for, you know, all of my life. And I want to continue to work in a communication field. And uh, I hope that I'm still healthy enough to be doing it as much as I can in 10, 20 years from now. Mm-hmm. You know, I'd still like to be like, I don't ever really want to quit. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I've never been one of those people who says, uh, I count uh, days till I retired. I just, I would like to be, continue to do what I like doing. And, and you're going to be able to. Why? Yeah. Because you have learned and continued to learn how to build a strong, healthy body. Yeah. And since you have learned and you're continuing to learn how to build a strong, healthy body, body's not going to break down. Mm-hmm. And you'll be able to continue in the communications that would feed you and you like it and you enjoy it and you love it. It's where you want to stay because your body's not going to break down. Yeah. It body again was just can't say it enough. The body is not designed to break down. Yeah. The body is designed to continue. It does require maintenance. And, yeah, and the body works, the mind works. Absolutely. And the, the chemistry, of course, of all that is just really, really connected. So you're going to always be able to be in the communication business because you're going to keep your body strong and healthy. Yeah. Well, I, uh, you know, people should uh, check out uh, your uh, Facebook page, Ageless Athletes, Ageless and go Athletes, to yeah. YouTube and check out Ageless, Ageless Athletes, Athletes there. It's on YouTube or Facebook. Yeah, you've got workout, uh, you got some, um, uh, work, some exercises there that people can, mm-hmm. uh, can, uh, can take a look at and uh, do at home, especially now in a situation right now where people are going to be at home uh, more than they would like to. Around the world, many people are at home, kind of almost semi-permanent, okay? And uh, you brought up a little while ago, about half of my training, half of my clients do not go to the gym. Mm -hmm. We do body weight exercises down at the beach. And so, yeah, if if you would like to go to the YouTube channel, I've got it. Actually, I made a uh, playlist called the Body Weight Series. And there are 10 videos in that. Each video is a demonstration of a single exercise. Paul, it's been a pleasure working out with you these past six or seven months now. And it looks like I'm going to be here for a while longer. So we're going to continue to do that and uh, and, uh, keep building the uh, healthy body, healthy mind. So uh, I I want to thank you for uh, that. It's been great working out with you and getting to know you uh, as a friend as well. And um, and then today, hearing more about your story um, beyond uh, your work here today uh, as a a fitness and wellness uh, uh, coach. 
thank you for your time. Thank you again for your service. Yeah, thank you for, for that. And, and, and it's been a pleasure to train with you guys these months as well to get to know you guys. One of the things I said is I like all of my clients and I like you and Belinda as good people to be around. So it makes it fun and enjoyable for me. So I appreciate that. Uh, thanks for saying and thanks for your service. I appreciate that. Uh, thanks for saying that you've enjoyed the training. I appreciate that. Uh, that's what I do. And I really, really appreciate that. Well, thanks for uh, coming and joining me today in the studio and uh, again, sharing your story. It's been fun, man. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a real pleasure. And uh, just uh, keep on keeping on, man. Uh, you're, you're, you're doing good things here. I sure appreciate that. Uh, and so we're going to finish up with uh, super good to see you today, Dave. Namaste. Namaste, my friend. What a great conversation. Paul has certainly done some incredible things in his young life so far. One thing we didn't touch on in our chat was that though Paul was disappointed as a young man to have not qualified to be a fighter pilot due to his stigmatism, he did study and eventually became an accomplished civilian pilot. How's that for determination? Moving on. This is a story told by my good friend, Jonathan Baldock. Time for another installment of... Please don't try this at home. I'm Jonathan Baldock, and this is my story. Years ago, when my daughter was two, my wife was seven months pregnant, we took her to a restaurant. My daughter had just learned how to use the potty. Everywhere we went, she wanted to use the restroom. Right on cue, my daughter's like, let's go pee. My wife said, I'm so pregnant, that's not happening with me. And I'm like, okay, that's cool, no problem, I'll take care of it. So I walk my daughter through the super busy restaurant. People are like, oh, your daughter's so cute. Oh my gosh, look at your cute daughter. And in my head, I'm like, oh, wow, yeah. Like, <laughs> I did that. I made a cute kid. Hopefully the second one's just cute, but at least this one's cute. I love that. We get in the men's room and it is packed. All the urinals are full, guys are washing their hands. All the stalls are basically full except one. We walk into that one vacant stall. There's a reason why it's vacant like a shit massacre in there. As I get in there, I realize she can't touch anything because I think my daughter's going to die. She's going to get some of this grossness on her. So I hold her kind of like a football, help her with her pants down. She's wearing like, I think it was like a pull-up at the time. Get the pull-up down. And then I straight arm her out. So both my arms are, are extended to the straight. So not easy to hold a kid straight out like that. My daughter's taken in the sights. She's daydreaming, looking around. Maybe 15 seconds later, three drops of pee come out. Is that it? Are y'all done, sweetie? She's like, nods. I'm like, okay, cool. I pull her back in like a football. I go to pull up her uh, pants and uh, I grab some toilet paper to give her a quick wipe first. When I go to give her the wipe, I didn't realize two days before uh, my wife had taught her that her privates are private. And so when I went to wipe her, she yelled at the top of her lungs, Daddy, don't touch me there. That's private. My life started to flash before my eyes. The men's room, which was full of conversation, instantly was dead silent. I thought I heard like a 911 being dialed on one of the phones. I, I didn't know what to do. So I just sort of hoisted her like a football, yanked up her clothing. We bolt out of the bathroom. As I get out of the stall, everyone is stopped and just staring at me like there's the guy that when the cops come, we, we know which guy did it. So I race back over to the table. I sit down and I basically tell my wife, that is the very last time I take our daughter to the bathroom. I'm Jonathan Baldock, and that was my story. Thanks to Jonathan for that. It's worth pointing out again that it is Jonathan that urged me to launch this podcast, which has really turned into a rewarding experience for me. My thanks to him for that. And talking about thankfulness, a big thank you again to Mr. Jerry Stamp, who wrote and performed the Cool Story theme song and all other jingles and stings that appear on this show. Do yourselves a favor and look for Jerry's music wherever you stream. And finally, thank you for listening. Until next time. Everybody. 
Everybody's had some adventures Everybody's had a few close calls Everybody's got a story What's yours?